to talk about the cost of globalization. So the cost of globalization. There's a sale on right now, right? And we all know that sales are great. 90% off. Go get your labor overseas. It's cheaper. It's better. What about those global resources? Let's go mining. Let's get down to Mexico and dig up everything they've got. Let's get down to Nigeria and get that oil out of the ground because we need that stuff. So global sale on right now, guys. Unfortunately, limited stock available. It's a real problem. And it's exclusive to members only. I'm not sure if we mentioned that before, but you need to take note. If you want to see our terms and conditions for this global sale, we advise you to go to gap.org. All sorts of details on there for you guys to learn from. But global sale on, it's fantastic, 90% off. So now we're going to act uh, the case of a Chinese iPad worker. Sartak will be the worker. Sartak <laughs> um, will be the CEO of Foxconn. And Keith and Johnny will be the bodyguards. So we're Foxconn, right? We're the good guys. We make all the good stuff and fantastic, fantastic standard of living for all these Chinese workers. So here's one of our classy men. Mr. Sartak, we've got good news for you, Tom. We've got very good news. <laughs> yeah, so we're interested in giving you more hours. Uh, and we're going to give you a little bit more money. So how's 22 hours for tomorrow? I think this guy is crazy. I work for him like 18 hours. Are you crazy? We're doing you. You see how thin I am? You don't need the money. This is good for you. I have friends here. Are you crazy? I'm not going to work for you. I'd rather go in suicide. I'm going to jump out this window. No, I'm going to jump out this window. 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 We're not going to let our workers commit suicide. No, no, no. We're smart people. Okay. So we've got a contract for you here, Sartak. If you don't sign that contract, you're out of work. How's that going to handle? How are you going to handle your family? It's okay. like I've got like no oh, I've got got idea. Idea. Why don't we make it easy it's for you? Nice Why don't you come along here and you sign this nice contract? No, but okay. I don't want to. What, 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 what probably can't read or write anyway, but I tell you, why don't you just put a little squiggle down there, and it's win-win, this is global trade, right? Win-win. You get more hours, you get more pay, we get more Apple products, and everybody's happy, right? This crazy guy leaves me no option. I just have to do it. Have it. End of have story. It. Thank you very much for the files. Okay, so as you can see, workers at two factories owned by Foxconn, which produces millions of Apple's products each year, are being treated like machines. Among the allegations made by workers are claims that excessive overtime is a routine despite the legal limit of 36 hours a month. Workers can perform up to 98 hours a month. Uh, to meet high demands, workers are pressured to take only one day off in 13. Badly performing workers are required, are required to be publicly humiliated in front of their colleagues. They also have crowded worker dormitories, can sleep up to 24 workers, and are subject to strict rules. And above that, workers are, were asked to sign a statement uh, promising not to kill themselves and pledging to treasure their lives due to a spate of suicides last summer. Ladies and gentlemen, that is an example of Apple manufacturing in China. We have perceptions about Apple being high quality. They're our friends. That was a real case study about how Apple treat their workers. It makes you think twice about what's really going on. Now, what are we really being sold here with globalization? So, race to the bottom. Race to the bottom is the, is the situation in which companies and countries compete with each other by cutting wages, cutting living standards, and moving production to, work, to places where wages are, lo are the lowest and workers have fewest rights. So it translates in Italy to the 21st century slave labor. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to speak about the environment. Uh, as it said, exploiting the cheapest resources. It's a race to the bottom. Whoever gets there first gets a deal. So everybody together just goes for wherever they want the resources, the cheapest available. So they keep on exploiting them like the labor, raw materials and stuff like that. There's over-reliance on fossil fuels. For example, if there's 
too much of petrol in some country and they just go, they don't care of what other people think of what is it sustainable for the next generation or not. They just go and they just grab whatever they can. That is what happens. There's destruction of natural forests. I don't think I need to speak a lot about that because everybody knows that what happened. There's over intensive agriculture practice. Now I would like to highlight a little bit because if you go over intensive, then you know you use excess of fertilizers, the natural habitat of that place is destroyed. And many times, you know, it may also result into desertification, which is the ultimate price that you pay. And then there's wasteful consumer culture there. No, this picture. For this we're gonna show some pictures. Yeah. We're not gonna act actually, but we're gonna show some pictures so you can actually all see this, what's going on. All this waste that we're producing, why is there so much waste? Is it perhaps because it's cheaper for Coca-Cola to sell us Coke in cans than it is through other mechanisms? Um, are there not smarter ways of doing this? Yes, there probably are. But does it cost more money up front? Yes. So what are we really paying for? What's the real price? And this is just one example of one horrific landfill. We all know this is happening on a global scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is excess of production. I I'm not going to speak much on this because you know what this is. If there's, uh, if you get cheap production in one country, you just go and you don't care about what global standards do they have to follow, or do they have to take care of the environment or not. They just keep on producing and this is what happens. Then a company which manufactures some drugs or pharmaceuticals or something, so they release excess of chemicals into the water. Now, this is what is the consequence. Now people over there who rely on having fish as their food daily, on a daily basis, what are they going to do when you know, uh, this is going to be the case? They probably have to look out for something else. Forest destruction in Sumatra, this is a place in western Indonesia, where the whole area, as you can see, the erosion trees and all, and they just cut it off. Why? Because they had some multinational company coming up with a big plan over there. So they had no second thoughts, they and, just did it. And key to this situation, that multinational company was able to do this because trade barriers for importing foreign timber have gone down. And very often they're relying on criminal practice in these countries. And what's happening is the forests are going. Now how are you going to grow that back? That ain't going to come back for generations, if ever at all. Um, so this depletion of resources is unsustainable. It's a major concern. Now if we keep going this way, it's all going to end in tears. And now this is one of the examples of our intensive farming of soybeans. You can see what it does. And now, yeah. So I want to talk quickly about a case study about the paradox of plenty. This is economic theory which is backed by substantial evidence. This is evidence that the WTO does not examine when it makes its policy decisions. It's simply not sophisticated enough to understand a case study like this. So the paradox of plenty, let's look at Nigeria. It should be one of the wealthiest countries in the world. It has enormous mineral reserves. It has a substantial population, the largest population in Africa. However, the paradox here is that Nigeria is still one of the poorest countries in the world with incredible poverty. So the theory of the paradox of plenty is that countries with an abundance of natural, natural resources like minerals, like fuels, they tend to have less economic growth. Well, we've been hearing the opposite from people at like the WTO. These people have got resources, they will therefore be made richer when their markets are opened up. But what's really happened in Nigeria? So the people of the Delta, that's in the south of Nigeria where most of the oil fields are, there are millions of people living there in abject poverty. Now, independent auditing tells us that 70% of the people in this area live on less than a dollar a day, and yet they're surrounded by something described as black gold. So where's the money going, and why are they living? Surrounded by oil. Now, I'll give you a quick idea of the level of pollution. This is people living in the oil. They're breathing in toxic chemicals, it pollutes their water. Is it any wonder that the life expectancy in this area is going down 
fast. You're lucky to live past 40 if you live here. And it's not a small number of people. We're talking at least 7 million people. Now, who's caused this mess? It's companies like Shell, ExxonMobil. They're the ones that are profiting from this. And they're buddies in the Nigerian government. And they're doing it with the implicit consent of the World Trade Organization, who do not regulate on these matters. They say, it's not our problem. It's a local issue. We can't interfere. So, we've created a living hell in Nigeria. Now, who's going to tell us that this is progress? There's more oil spilt in this region every single year than in the Gulf of Mexico last year. With that enormous crisis, it happens every year. And it's been happening for over 40 years. These people are living in puddles of oil because of a leaking infrastructure. And nobody is taking responsibility for this. Who are the beneficiaries? Because it ain't the Nigerians. OK, now we're going to talk about the WTO. Yeah. So the WTO, one of the greatest criticisms of globalization is the fact that it's a menace to democracy. And one of the biggest uh, violators of that is the WTO that we found. Um, because they go, they have these general meetings and they say that they have democratic decisions made by consensus, but in practice, they go into these green room uh, discussion rooms and uh, with, with those, with hand-picked um, nations and talk about issues and they come up with a particular... Colombia is <laughs> going to represent India. Douglas is going to represent the UK. Um, John is going to represent United States, and Keith is going to represent Australia. So I would come up to these and say, yeah, I think in Nigeria, business as usual, I, think, I don't think we... Uh... I don't think we should be talking about that kind of thing in this kind of forum. We, we've all read the rules on the WTO. It's about trade. It's about doing more business. And if we start interfering, what's going to happen? You know, people are going to start asking questions. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. So what do you guys think? I think that we should keep the conversation over here while these guys over here have their own conversation. Well, okay, let's talk about other things. This is clearly not a number of minutes. No, we have all here. What about the agricultural policy? You guys have it in You guys pretty... Things going very well. We are going No, it's fantastic. I'm really pleased. Colombia too. A huge progress the last few years. It's so exciting to see this happening. Finally, our, our free trade policy is working. And then what happens is that they come up with a press conference and they basically say, "We've made a democratic decision to live, let what happens in Nigeria." It's like people in poorer countries and. They, they don't consider their opinion. That is what happens. And one more fact that I would like to highlight is that uh, we actually, all five of us, were pro-globalization, but we were supposed to present against globalization. And uh, the fact is that after doing the research and stuff like that, we definitely give uh, opinions a second thought. That what are we doing? Are we doing the right thing or not? So to conclude, as the narrator of this story, we're going to show you a slow, a small video about the Bobo gas uh, tragedy. What this was, was one of the worst industrial accidents in our time. And uh, it was caused by a chemical leak of methyl isocyanide, or MIC. And basically that's the chemical that we use to make fertilizer. And as you know, everyone wants a green lawn. 11,000 people died, 550,000 people were injured. International production of this MIC gas became illegal in the United States, so we had a problem. We needed to farm that off to an international country who would take it. India was that country. The multinational corporation Union Carbide invested in India to meet their production goals of MIC. A plant in Bhopal, India was created implementing several cost-saving features. They downsized their supervisor staff, they hired unskilled workers, they reduced their factory maintenance, which led to the deterioration of pipes and valves, keeping the gas safe from the people.